Orion wasn't supposed to be my 1000th roller coaster. I actually planned for Texas Stingray to be my 1000th coaster. Back in March, when the pandemic shutdown started, I grabbed cheap airfare to Texas for late June, figuring it would be okay to go there. My original plan was to fly to Dallas and make a large loop hitting Magic Springs, Silver Dollar City, Frontier City, Cliff's Amusement Park, and pretty much every park in the entire state of Texas. As of late June, all of those parks had reopened except for Cliff's. However, a day before my trip, COVID-19 cases in Texas really started spiking. That was particularly true in the Dallas, San Antonio, and Houston areas. It didn't seem like the parks would close, and they still haven't as of this recording, but I figured it would be irresponsible and inappropriate to visit those parks when the mayors of the respective towns were urging citizens to stay home. So I made the smart decision and canceled my flight, but I had to eat the cost of the non-Six Flags and SeaWorld parks. Or so I thought. I found a reasonable price on a last minute flight to St. Louis, so I started reconfiguring my trip. I still wanted to hit Silver Dollar City, Magic Springs, and Frontier City, but I still had an extra week available. It was a no-brainer to add the two other major parks in Missouri, but then I realized I could travel east towards Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio. And that's when I realized Orion could be my 1,000th coaster. I just had to rack up enough credits on the way. My trip began at Six Flags St. Louis. I had previously been to this park, so there were no new credits. It was my first chance to see the new measures Six Flags implemented following the lockdown. I loved the new entry procedure, it was so fast. But the wipe downs in between ride cycles were brutal for efficiency. That being said, I was able to get on all the major coasters at least once, and I was reminded that Six Flags St. Louis is one of the chain's more beautiful parks. Day 2 brought me to one of my favorite parks in the world in Silver Dollar City. Like Six Flags St. Louis, there were no new credits here, but I didn't care one bit. I was just happy to be back at Silver Dollar City. This park is perfect. I love the ride lineup, the staff, the food, the atmosphere, everything about it is fantastic. And the COVID-19 precautions really didn't slow things down outside of Powder Keg. My only regret was having one day at this park. Before making the drive to Magic Springs, I planned to hit a mountain coaster on the way, but they had all closed early. So instead I made a pit stop at Bigfoot Fun Park. This small park is home to one of those Soaring Eagle Thrill Towers, and I was in for a treat because I rode the Sky Sling with the ride operator and he knew how to throw his weight around to give us a ride with non-stop flipping. In the past I've only gotten one or two flips in these rides, and I still thought it was insane because of the minimalistic restraints. But with non-stop flipping, I found a newfound love for this ride. Day 3 was the first day in the trip where bad weather was an issue. In the morning, I was nervous if Magic Springs would even open. Every single weather site called for thunderstorms lasting most of the day. I was a bit irritated I had driven all the way to the remote regions of Arkansas for a closed park, or so I thought. But much to my amazement, Magic Springs actually opened. And not surprisingly, the park was dead. The storm held off for the first hour, so I was able to quickly knock out all the steel coasters. But before I could make it to Arkansas Twister, the thunderstorm started. This shut the rides down for two hours, and much to my shock, the park patiently waited it out and reopened everything in the afternoon. So I was able to get an Arkansas Twister, bringing my coaster count to 987. The coaster collection at Magic Springs was nothing to write home about, but it really is a beautiful park. It's just in the middle of nowhere. That night, I drove to Oklahoma City, and on day four, I went to Frontier City. And I didn't have the best experience here. I originally allocated a full day at this park, but half the attractions I wanted to ride were closed, including Diamondback, the Tumbleweed Chance Rotor, and all the water rides. I knocked out all four operating coasters very quickly, bringing me to 991. And while the park was charming, there just wasn't much I wanted to re-ride so I started looking at my options. I originally planned for Wonderland to be day five of my trip. The park was located in Texas, but Amarillo wasn't listed as code red, so I felt comfortable visiting there. So I made it to the park by 6 p.m., and this was the surprise hit of the trip. 
The park has a really odd mix of attractions, and if anything, I wish I had a bit more time to get some re-rides. But most importantly, I got 4 new coaster credits, bringing me to 995. The only coaster I missed there was an SBF Visa Spinner that was closed due to the park needing a part. A bad idea then popped in my head. The smart thing would have been to make day 5 a travel day. It was roughly 9 hours back to Missouri. But instead, I saw a path how to get a second day at Silver Dollar City. If I drove through the night, I could make it back to Silver Dollar City for opening and a second full day there. I then weighed the pros and cons of a hotel bed versus Outlaw Run, and Outlaw Run won. So I grabbed a supersized cup of coffee and drove through the night. And to be honest, the drive wasn't as bad as I expected since I had something amazing to look forward to in the end. But after my second day at Silver Dollar City, which was just as amazing as my first day I might add, I crashed hard. On day 6 I made my way to Worlds of Fun, which is towards the bottom of the Cedar Fair parks in my opinion but it's still a decent place. I enjoyed getting re-rides on the major attractions like Prowler and Patriot, but the highlight of the day was Coaster Credit 996, the Cosmic Coaster. I thought this kiddie coaster was off limits to adults in my last visit, which is why I skipped it, but this time I checked it off. Day 7 was another day impacted by bad weather. The Midwest was seeing bad thunderstorms on this day, Ultimately, I chose Holiday World because there were zero new credits I needed there, and I would pass right by the park on the way back to the St. Louis airport at the end of the trip, so if the day went south, I could return. But in all honesty, the bad weather made my day even better. While it did torrential downpour quite a bit over the course of the day, the thunder held off until the late afternoon, and as a result, Holiday World was deserted. This made every single attraction a walk-on, there were less lines this day than at Hollywood Nights, so I had no issue lapping Voyage, Legend, Raven, and Thunderbird. Now the park did close 3 hours early, but the park gave rain checks to return, which was a much appreciated and completely unnecessary gesture, considering they were open most of the day and I had no issue getting on anything. Day 8 brought me to the recently saved Indiana Beach. After a disappointing visit in 2017, I was happy to realize the park's potential on this visit. The boardwalk atmosphere was fantastic, and I loved the park's unique mix of rides, most notably Cornball Express and Lost Coaster. But more importantly, I got Coaster Credit 997 on Tigger, the park's Schwarzkopf Jetstar that was closed on my last visit. I had a reservation booked for Kings Island on day 11, so I need to find two more Coaster Credits over the next two days. I wasn't anticipating Diamondback or Spinosaurus being closed. On day 9 I started at Kentucky Kingdom and made a quick lap getting rides in Lightning Run, Kentucky Flyer, and Storm Chaser. Once I had my fill of airtime, I made a quick pit stop to Indiana Caverns to ride their Bat Chaser Zipline Coaster. Now I know not everyone would consider this a coaster, but I personally do. It feels much more like a suspended coaster than a zipline. The ride was mostly uneventful, but the stop on the brake run was so abrupt that it caused some really out of control swinging. This ride brought me to 998. I then returned to Kentucky Kingdom for the rest of the night. Originally I was questioning why I didn't just visit Indiana Caverns first so I wouldn't have to interrupt my Kentucky Kingdom visit, but this ended up being a prudent decision because Storm Chaser went down for the day sometime after I left. If I had started at Indiana Caverns, it's likely I would have missed Storm Chaser on this trip, and I would have been quite upset about that. So I finished off the night getting lots of re-rides and lightning run, and I really want to know why more parks haven't added more of these Chance Hyper GTX coasters. They are fantastic rides. Day 10 brought me to Pigeon Forge. I started at Dollywood and made a beeline to lightning rod. Even though this is my favorite coaster, I do not have the best track record getting on it. For reference, it was closed the first four times I visited Dollywood after it opened. And I'm glad I went to Lightning Rod first because, as expected, the ride had a ton of downtime later in the day. After getting a lap on the major coasters, I briefly left Dollywood to get a ride on another zipline coaster. This one being the Flying Ox at Paula Deen's Lumberjack Adventure Park. I thought that the zipline coaster was marginally better than the one at Indiana Caverns due to the wilder swing but I still prefer the coasters at Dollywood and the region's Alpine coasters. 
but Flying Ox did its purpose as it was my 999th coaster, so Orion was all lined up. When I returned to Dollywood, I got re-rides on the operating coasters. It was a bit tricky to get re-rides on Lightning Rod because it kept breaking down, but I was able to get at least one night ride at the end of the day. At night, Lightning Rod is an unbeatable coaster experience if you ask me. It's pitch black and completely out of control. I had a long drive to Kings Island that night, but I got distracted on the way and stopped at the Mountain Monster Complex. I thought it was closed when I passed it earlier in the day, but it just opened late. This was something I tried doing last December, but it was closed for the season, so I was eager to finally try it out. This is the second version of the ride system used in Pterodactyl. This launch swing feels like a sky coaster and it's a ton of fun. That's especially true because you load and unload atop the tower, and the only way down is a drop tower, so essentially you get two rides in one. Day 11 was my triumphant moment when I made Orion my 1000th coaster. So I took a moment to appreciate all the kiddie coasters over the years that got me to that point. Orion was operating on a boarding pass system, so I was only guaranteed one ride on it. So I requested the front for my milestone ride and I really enjoyed the newest Giga Coaster. After riding all my favorites at Kings Island, I lingered around the entrance to Orion during the last hour of park operation because the park did say they planned to open the standby queue after the final boarding group finished. And as planned, the park opened Orion's queue. And because the queue was so empty, I was able to quickly board once and re-enter the queue again for a third ride before it was closed off for the night. The park closed the queue before the 10pm closing time since Orion cannot run during the fireworks. Since it was the 4th of July, I didn't feel comfortable making that long drive at night, so I hunkered down in a hotel for the night, and most of day 12 was spent driving towards the St. Louis airport. But I did have enough time to stop in the Six Flags St. Louis to grab a lunch meal, and get a few more re-rides because the park was even more dead than my weekday visit at the start of the trip, and I found that a bit odd. But I wasn't complaining since I could get more re-rides in Mr. Freeze, Boss, and American Thunder. And now I'm sitting at home serving out a quarantine, but it was well worth it for this trip. Are you planning on making any long road trips this year? I'd love to hear your thoughts down below. I think one of the best things about this personal trip was all the flexibility. By waiting to book hotels last minute, I was able to change my park plans on the fly based on the weather and necessary coaster credits. The only difference from past years is that I did have to update reservations for some of the parks as I went along. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for more coaster content here at Canopy Coaster.